Okay, well, here we are on 2 o'clock Monday. Time for more Bayesian PKPD. Boy, compared to Thursday, this is a pretty small crowd here, I see. Uh, hopefully more of you will join by uh, by recording here, but I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, so on, on Thursday, I had started out talking about uh, how to do user program models with Bugs Model Library. Open this up here. Uh, and in particular, we talked about how to implement uh, linear compartmental models. What I was going to start out the day with today is to talk about implementing uh, more general uh, compartmental models, those that may have nonlinearities or other complications that uh, that can't be described using the matrix ex matrix exponential format. Uh, so we're going to start out with that today. Uh, then we'll spend a little bit more time than usual talking about the uh, the next hands-on exercise, uh, which will be having you work with some of these elements, and in particular you're going to have to use the what we're going to talk about today, working with writing your own uh, your own model. Uh, written in terms of ordinary differential equations. Uh, we're going to make use of some of the previous topics we talked about, in particular uh, use of the cut function. Uh, let's see, that was what we talked about uh, just before we got into the Bugs Model uh, custom models. Uh, and before that, what were we talking about? Uh, uh, what I was trying to look for, okay, we're, I've wandered a field too far, we won't go looking for the slides anyway, but we were talking before about using uh, informative uh, prior distributions uh, in in our modeling, and so our, our, our next hands-on example is also going to be taking advantage of of those ideas. So we've got a whole bunch to cover in that. In fact, given that, I think uh, we're going to probably plan on something like maybe two weeks overall to uh, to go through that particular uh, hands-on exercise. Uh, and then finally, I think we'll have enough time to talk about a, a topic I've added in here. Uh, I have think in the past I've alluded to the idea that it's possible for you to write your own bugs functions. Uh, and and that's one way to get around some of the limitations of the WinBugs model specification language. Uh, so I was going to spend a little bit of time today showing you how you can go about uh, writing your own WinBugs function using the WB Dev package uh, that David Lund put together a while back. So we'll move on to that too today, I think. And I think that'll probably cover it for the day. Okay, so let's move on to... Uh, our bugs model library uh, where we're going to write our own model in terms of differential equations. Uh, again here uh, we no longer need to assume that uh, that we can write out our model in terms of a linear uh, compartmental model with constant coefficients. Here we're allowing for fairly arbitrary or, uh, first order ordinary differential equations. So the kinds of models we're talking about are ones that you can describe in terms of an equation like I've put here. Uh, it's where here the x prime then means the derivative of x with respect to t. Uh, so, and on the right hand side we have some function then of uh, possibly time and definitely of, of x are the amounts in our various compartments. Or the, I say amounts, that's in most pharmacokinetic models we're thinking amounts but of course when we think more broadly they may represent other kinds of quantities. Uh, so we'll, we'll go ahead and look at that. Uh, just mention here the think of all of these as being potentially vector valued quantities so x is a uh, maybe a vector corresponding to multiple uh, compartments in a model uh, f again may be a vector valued function and then of course x prime is going to be a vector that has the same number of elements as x uh, in here. So this is just a general way of writing a, a system of ordinary differential equations. Uh, so let's so as an example here I mention a fairly familiar one. Let's take a, a two-compartment model uh, with Michaelis-Metten elimination 
Uh, so here we're going to have a system of two differential equations then. Uh, we've got our for our central compartment our x1 prime for the uh, derivative with respect to time for our amount the central compartment. Uh, we're going to have a uh, we've got a, a michaelis metten component here describing uh, elimination from the central compartment plus a uh, transfer rate constant associated with transfer into the second compartment. Of course, we're all, that's all going to be uh, negative here because we're talking about uh, things that are removing materials from the central compartment, all multiplied by our x1. I guess the way I wrote this one here, it depends, it's, this actually isn't even my favorite convention, but right now I've got Km written in terms of an amount rather than a concentration, and Vmax, of course, is the maximal elimination rate. Uh, and then finally you have a, another term here for the return of, of drug from the peripheral compartment. And then for our uh, second compartment, our peripheral compartment, it's the usual our relationship we're assuming uh, just linear transfers to and from that compartment so it's just our k12x1 minus k21x2 so but we've got a nonlinear component here with our michaelis metten uh, relationship here so we can't describe this in terms of a matrix exponential expression like we did uh, in the previous example so we would have to describe that just in terms of our uh, nonlinear differential equation here uh, in WinBugs, there's two methods available to you for numerically solving this differential equation. Uh, one is a Runge-Kutta fourth-fifth order method uh, that is actually it's one that's sort of an undocumented built-in element of, of WinBugs, sort of. It's never really been linked into WinBugs, but it's there. Uh, and we took advantage of that. And uh, now that one has the uh, the advantage that it can be faster for problems that are non-stiff, uh, and which you know will often happen with some of the simpler pharmacokinetic models. And so for simpler ones like our two-compartment model here, chances are the the Runge-Kutta method will perform fairly well and probably a bit faster than the second method. Uh, which uses a uh, subroutine uh, taken from a the Livermore collection of solvers, this one called LSODA, which is, well, you can see that it's actually an acronym for Livermore Solver for Ordinary Differential Equations with Automatic Method Switching for Stiff and Non-Stiff Problems, meaning that it's got uh, some code in there that attempts to discern whether or not the differential equations are stiff, and if they are, it chooses one method, and if it decides they're not, it chooses a different method uh, to try and uh, you know, come up with an optimal choice of methodologies in an automatic way. And that tends to be, I would say, sort of the more robust method. And certainly if you have a problem that uh, over at least some parts of the parameter space becomes stiff, it will tend to be faster than using the Runge-Kutta method. Uh, and if you had to pick one as a sort of general purpose one, the LSODA would probably be your better choice, but just recognize that for some problems it may run a bit slower uh, than the Runge-Kutta method, uh, but it will almost always run successfully. Okay, so those are the choice we're going to have in here, and I think my next, okay, in my my next page here I'm just going to illustrate how would we implement a model like this one uh, using the bugs model library. Uh, the approach is similar to what we did for the um, f for the linear uh, differential equation problem. The user has to edit a, a template uh, template component Pascal uh, function and put in you know replace the some of the code that's in the template with with a code appropriate for the model they're doing. And that's what I'm illustrating here. What I've done is just pulled out an excerpt from that template that contains the main component that the user has to change in this case. Uh, so what you'll find, whether you're using the Runge-Kutta or the uh, LSODA method, that you have a function called user derivatives. 
uh, that current that the template already has written out for a somewhat different model uh, than we have right here but you can go through and edit it uh, generally I've just like I did in the linear case I've included the parts in the original template which which you're going to want to change I put those in red and the and the components that you're not likely to want to change are in black so and I've shown that too on the slide here so here are the key things that you need to write uh, if you're going to write your own are the differential equations which appear then right down here on the bottom so you can see here we've got uh, uh, the the name that you have to use here then is dx dt uh, and again remind you that with component pascal the derivative or the I'm sorry the vectors uh, begin with element 0 rather than element 1 so what in this slide we called x1 or if you like dx dt1 in component pascal is going to be written as dx dt0 it's going to be the zeroth element of a vector called dx dt uh, and then you've got our again I'm going to remind you that for component Pascal the assignment operator is not just an equals it's a colon followed by an equals and then you can see uh, code over here just like on the previous page so we've got a Vmax over km uh, plus in this case x0 again which corresponds to the x1 in the previous equations uh, so you've got that term and then plus k12 all with a minus in front of the entire quantity multiplying our x0 and then plus a k21 times x1 so again it's probably worth reminding yourself that that's essentially identical to what we have here except where you have subscripts 1 and 2 here they become elements 0 and 1 of the x vector and then for our for our second compartment, we've got dx dt1, and then it's just k12 times x0 minus k21 times x1. <laughs> so we've got our basic equations written, but we've written them in terms of names that the component Pascal code doesn't understand unless you tell it what they are. And so you can see here where I've made assignments. So again, just like in the linear case, the derivatives are passed as a vector called theta, which you can see right up here. So that's our, our input argument into here. That's our vector of parameter values. Uh, and in fact, I could have used the thetas with the uh, with the indices down in the equations on the bottom but that makes it harder to read so what I've done here is I've assigned the various components of theta to f names that are familiar to us over here are Vmax, Km, K12 and K21 excuse me and uh, and then use those names down here and of course since we've come up with a bunch of new names uh, we have to declare what they are in particular they're all going to take on real values as opposed to integer or something else so we have to declare them all as as real valued quantities here so that's really the core of what the user has to write uh, as you can see most of it is somewhat Fortran like but with some quirks that are specific to Pascal Again, I also remind you, notice that all Pascal uh, uh, statements here end with semicolons. One of my favorite things is to forget those. Okay, so let's see what's next. Okay, so that's the basic theme. Now there's a little bit more, and if you recall the steps we went through uh, in the example we did for the linear model, we know we've got a bunch of sort of bookkeeping steps. Um, uh, so we've got to go through and edit. Uh, our template to describe our own model and then we have to do some compiling we have to do some other things to actually link it into WinBugs taking advantage of the WB dev package so let's actually step through that uh, for a particular example uh, and the example I have here is actually the one that comes with the bugs model library uh, distribution set 
Uh, and I just realized I need to open up our bugs model library user manual so I can show you what we're going to do. So for our demo here, we're going to look at a two compartment pharmacokinetic model. Uh, but then it's going to be connected to an effect or a PD outcome here via an indirect effect model with a drug effect on the K out component of that. So let me uh, do what I forgot to do, which was fire up the manual here. Let's see. So we can see that part of the stuff. Okay, let's uh let's see we don't really need the sidebar here. Let's get rid of that. Okay, let's scroll on down, make everybody dizzy. Okay, well, I'll remind you again, so we had these simulated examples, and the last time we focused on one where we were dealing with an effect compartment model, and I guess an Emacs function of that for that endpoint. This endpoint's going to be a little different, so for our, what's labeled in here as R2, uh, our second response in here, uh, let's see what happens if I try to do this full screen so I can scribble on it. Uh, that doesn't work so good. That made it kind of tiny, didn't it? Okay, never mind. Let's stick with the original format. Oh, come on. Come on, there should be a zoom to fit here. Where is it? Okay, well, I'll just do it this way. Okay, so for R2 here, let's scroll back down to it. Uh, that's what we've got here. So that's kind of what we're focusing on in this section right down here. So we're going to have that as being a log normal, uh, log normal likelihood relative to our expectation. But sort of the interesting part for what we're doing now is this differential equation here where we've got the derivative uh, with respect to our effect here is described by our indirect action model. So um, all of this here is a conflation really of the usual uh, uh, indirect effect model where you've got a K out multiplying uh, our, actually which way goes which here? Yeah, I'm trying to remember why I conflated it the way I did. I should have looked at this before I got here again. Do, 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 do. So that's our base on. Yeah, I actually did some other solutions in between here that makes it hard to see some of the patterns. But basically what we've got here is we've got our K out times our baseline for that compartment minus uh, this term here, which ha involves a uh, an inhibitory uh, Emax model here uh, multiplying our R2 in here. Uh, so that's going to be our indirect action model describing the, uh, it's not really an amount in this case, but describing our effect associated with this particular compartment uh, in here. Uh, then we've got some uh, uh, additional things for inter-occasion, I'm sorry, inter-individual variability on things like our uh, baseline response are EC50 uh, and the K out in here. Uh, and these are just the numbers that were used to do the simulations to create our data. But what we're going to fit is essentially this model that we've got up here. So let's uh, wander off to our Windows world over here to show the process. Uh, let's uh, wander on down. So the, the key things I wanted to show you is not so much the entire process of doing the modeling as it is the process of building uh, the function that we need in order to do the modeling. But it's probably worth at least showing you 
Uh, let's go ahead and fire up uh, our black box wind bugs here. Let's start by showing you the model uh, that I was actually, the bugs model portion of it. So this is, where did I put all that stuff? Okay, we just did that last time. Oh, I bet I know where it is. It's up here. There we go. Okay, this is in my Bugs Model Library examples. And that one is, here we go, our indirect action, but let's do it. Uh, let's start out uh, with the Runga Cutter version of it, although the R code and the model itself for the difference between the Runga Cutter and the LSODA is nothing more than the name where I stuck in. Uh, stuck in that. So, okay, here's the model itself. Okay. Okay, so the basic model is is very much like you've already seen before in a number of examples, so there's nothing particularly new here. Uh, we've got our inter-occasion, I'm sorry, inter-individual variability uh, for our PK parameters, and I separated those from the inter-individual uh, variabilities in the PD parameters. So already we've got a model that's making an assumption, in this case an assumption that uh, the PD and the PK parameters are not uh, correlated. So that's pretty much the same as before. Uh, and and even the stuff that we have down below here. Let me widen this a little. Uh, here when we finally call our bugs model library function, that all looks the same again as the kinds of things we've done before. The only thing that's really different uh, is the name right here. So you can see I've called it here this 2CPT in effect 1 model RK45. Uh, by the way, even though I put the RK45 to remind myself that uh, I've used the Runga Kutta method, there's nothing magic about putting the uh, RK45 in the name. That's just a, a naming convention I've used here. Uh, so other than that, there's really nothing new compared to the other examples we've done uh, using uh, Bugs Model Library. It's just, So the new things all have to do with actually building that function. So let's go take a look at that. So let's go down to... Actually, where are we? Uh, let me... Actually, let me go ahead and go down into our program files. Of course, in your case, this will be on your uh, USB stick if that's what you're using. So we've got our black box wind bugs. Let's go down to P metrics, the folder in there. Let's open that up. And we're going to open up the mod folder of that. And the so the model we're looking at right now then, uh, it, by the way, this model happens to be also the one that is used is 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 the template that's distributed uh, with Bugs Model Library. So that's what we're looking at at first. Let me grab that. So here you can see the two CPT in F1 model RK45. Let's grab that guy and look at it here. Uh, let me make it readable okay so uh, as before I've again marked the things that you may want to change in red um, now, I just noticed one important exception that I should have made red and didn't, and that's the name. Because uh, if you recall before, one of the things that you need to do if you're going to create a new, uh, a, a new uh, component Pascal file from the existing one is we're going to want to save, uh, well, we're going to want to save a copy of it. 
uh, under a new name uh, and rename it and rename things like at the top and the bottom. Uh, there may actually be at least one place internally uh, where this name appears again too. I believe there is so we also need to change that if we're going to do this. Uh, we'll do that in a second but let me take you on a little tour of this one first and then suggest that we just to illustrate the process of writing your own function let, we'll, uh, we'll, I'll make some changes here and show what we would have to do to actually implement them. Okay, so let's go down here. One of the first things the user has to do other than change the name, in fact, just to highlight the name change, let me go ahead and make this red so that we can see it here. Come on. Okay. So let's go down. One of the first things we need to do is we need to tell it how many differential equations. So we've got a system of, of a certain number of scalar differential equations, uh, and in our case it's going to be four. And just to remind you why it's four, okay come on guys why are we slowing down again? Uh, let me uh, take a look at this. So the reason why it's four Let's scroll up here. Is we're also going to put our uh, our PK model in it, and recall the PK model is a two compartment model plus first order absorption. So we've got three compartments associated with the PK, and then we have one additional compartment then uh, described down here uh, that for our PD component. So that's why we have four. So that's where this num eq equals 4. You need, the user needs to set that. Uh, and then, again, the bulk of the activity. Let me lengthen this. Okay, that wasn't supposed to do that. There we go. Okay, is inside this user derivatives function right here. Uh, and the, by the way, the form of the user derivatives function is the same whether you use the Runga Kutta fourth, fifth order method or the LSODA method. So, so you can write that once, and if you need to, you can copy and paste it uh, to uh, the LSODA template if you need it. Uh, and so the main work here, uh, as we just described, is the user needs to specify. Uh, the differential equations uh, that are being used inside the model. And that's what's going on right down here at the bottom. So if we look at this, you'll see the first three equations here are nothing more than the standard two compartment model with first order absorption. Uh, again, you just have to remember the things like starting your vectors at zero instead of one. So you can see we've covered the uh, so we're covering there's x from 0, x0, zero, x1, and x2. So in this case, x1 corresponding to our central compartment. Now the if we step back, let me jump back again here. Uh, in here, the way I've written the equation for our, for our effect compartment, or not our effect compartment, but our whatever our indirect action compartment here, uh, notice that this is written in terms of concentrations. So I've incorporated an intermediate step here. Actually, it doesn't matter whether it doesn't actually have to be at that point. You could have actually put it above it uh, since we're not calculating any of those elements uh, from those first three equations. Uh, but here I'm calculating concentration based upon our the amount in the central compartment and then dividing by V2, V2 being using the, uh, let me make sure I did that, yeah, in this particular uh, way I've written it, I've used sort of the non-MEM conventions of calling uh, the volume of the central compartment V2 instead of V1. And then finally, we've got the equation uh, that I've specified there, and I just remembered I've got another trick I need to tell you that I used in here. Um, but it, this, if you look at this, it's it's almost what you see. Let me just go over here in the previous page that I showed you. Uh, there is one slight difference in here. Uh, there's and and it's a and I've used a little trick here 
uh, to deal with the fact that there that for x for the x3 item here uh, there's actually a baseline value so the assumption here is essentially that the system is at steady state before uh, before the patient gets any drug treatment so we have to include a somehow we have to incorporate that baseline value into the model and the trick I'm using here to do it is recasting the differential equation in terms of difference from baseline instead of using it in the on the original scale and then subsequently inside I'll show you in, in a moment here inside the bugs model we add back in the baseline to get back onto the original scale uh, the reason for doing that is it allows you to pass that baseline value in as as a parameter which is what I've done here you can see this what I call YF0 here that's the baseline value that corresponds if we go back to our original thing this R20 uh, in the in the page here corresponds to what I call that YF0 uh, in the other page so that's going to be a modeled quantity and it gets passed as a parameter in here uh, now the alternative is is uh, you may you know in in non mem uh, a common trick that's done in order to pass uh, baseline values uh, that are going to be modeled is to do so by modeling f uh, within the models and actually you can do it that way here too but I've always found that a bit awkward uh, so others may find this all equally awkward but I tend to find this a more satisfactory way of doing it uh, so again I'm passing that baseline value instead of passing it like a dose into here I'm passing it as a parameter which gets incorporated in here and the this quantity here our x3 in here it, in fact I've written it as a comment right here that x3 in this case actually equals our yf here our our effect compartment our effect quantity here minus the baseline effect uh, is part of this um, but you have to keep track of that now keep in mind that when you take the derivative of the difference from baseline the derivative is actually the same as the derivative with respect to the original quantity because the because you're taking the derivative of a sum where you've simply added on a constant element here so when you take the derivative of y of zero you just get zero so in other words our dx dt three here is the same as would be a dyf dt uh, in here so that's the same so the only other trick I have to do is everywhere on the right hand side where I should have the uh, the effect in here I have to take my x3 and add back in the baseline in order to get the correct quantity so stepping back up here that corresponds to where you see r2 right here in order to get it back in that original scale then again I have to add back in the baseline anyway that's a common trick I tend to use uh, for incorporating uh, non-zero baseline values into this uh, let's see any other stories on that okay that's basically specifying those then again um, what I've done is in order to I prefer to write this using parameter names that are familiar to me uh, and that usually makes it more readable for others and easier to debug as a result so I do that but then I have to describe well what's the relationship between these parameters in here and the parameters that I'm actually passing in via this theta vector that we have here and so you can see all the assignments going on here setting what the relationships are uh, notice that by doing this you've also specified the order in which the quantities have to be passed when you call the function from uh, from winbucks so theta 0 corresponds to clearance theta 1 to q 2 to v2 and so on down the line here so th so you've got that uh, by the way the statement here I never really talked I think I used this in one of the others were an assert statement 
Uh, all an assert statement is is it's kind of a uh, an error control statement in here. Uh, it's basically saying that all of these statements inside here have to be true, and if they're not true, it's going to stop the program with an error message, or as they call it in 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 bugs, a trap. Uh, and that trap will get what and will include a code number which you put over here, hopefully a, a unique code. Uh, you know, so it'll say trap 20 and it'll tell you what uh, what procedure uh, the error occurred in. Uh, so here I'm simply requiring that all of these parameters be uh, uh, be uh, uh, greater than zero. Uh, in here. Uh, the one part that, you know, might be controversial is this DKA, as we'll see here, is the difference between KA and which lambda did I use here? I guess the smaller lambda, so it'd be lambda 2. Uh, I required that it be KA be bigger than lambda 2 uh, by making this statement. Uh, and then I do, there's some additional things here, getting our rate constants here uh, and, the, and here I go through the process of recovering Ka from that dKa which represents the difference between Ka and, and lambda 2. So that's kind of the story inside there and then the other part you need to change uh, and this again is very similar to what you saw with the linear case is specify these quantities here which is to tell the program how many total parameters there are in here so if we scroll up we can pretty well see what that is so we've got let's see we've got eight thetas in here we've got four compartments so that means we've got four F's and four T lags so we've got eight more parameters so we've got eight plus eight or sixteen parameters which is what I've got here you have to tell it what is the index for the uh, for where the F parameters begin uh, in this case it's going to be 8 because it's going to be one more than uh, than we've got here so that goes up to 7 so the next one will be the F's and then finally for the T lags uh, in this case I stack those right on top of the F so there's going to be 4 F's so if I put all 4 F's that'll take me up to 11 so 12 has to be where the uh, T lags begin and here we sort of it, you repeat again the number of compartments here, which is actually equivalent to the uh, number of equations here. Another example of where you can see some of this ought to be automatable, which will, somewhere in the next generation of Bugs Model Library will get rid of some of this sort of bookkeeping elements that should be uh, should be possible to do without the user having to do all of them. Okay, so that's that's basically all the pieces that you need to do in order to write the code uh, then you have to compile it and we then we have to do some additional things to link it in with WB dev um, what I thought I would do uh, so you can at least see the process of editing uh, this thing is why don't we do a different model uh, why don't we say do a um, why don't we go with the we'll go with one that isn't too different how about a two compartment model with uh, parallel first order and Michaelis Metten uh, elimination so we can illustrate the process of actually editing or altering this template to create a new model so one of the first things you would want to do is is first of all you don't want to overwrite this one we want to save it in a new name so why don't we go ahead and we'll uh, do a save as uh, and I don't know what do we want to call it here I guess we'll stick with the Runga Kutta format here and uh, why don't we just call it uh, oh I don't know I'll just call it uh, MMPAR for parallel here and we'll just uh, keep it at that okay so you can see the name changed in the upper bar up here uh, and let's go ahead and change all the instances where we see the original name that we had here I'm going to go ahead and copy that and let's do a uh, find and replace so we're going to take that oops I just pushed the wrong button there we go 
and uh, what did I call it? Okay. M M P A R. Okay, so we'll do that. And we'll replace all occurrences of that. Okay, so that took care of that. Okay, uh, the numbers of compartments now are going to change because we're only going to have, and to keep this simple, we're not even going to put first order absorption. Let's just do a, a simple, uh, uh, you know, like it was just a, uh, a, a bolus input into the central compartment just to keep it short. So that'll keep it, knock this down to two differential equations. Um, let's actually start by writing the differential equations rather than the uh, the rest of it because everything else depends kind of on the naming and everything we use there. Okay, so I'm going to want dx dt uh, 0 here. That's going to be for our central compartment in this case. Uh, so we're going to have to make that what? We're going to have minus uh, we're going to have, let's keep put in our first order component here, so we've got a K10. Uh, and then we've got a, our Michaelis Metten component in here, so we'll just call that Vmax over, uh, oh, I'll be lazy, let's just keep the KM in terms of uh, amount here rather than try to deal with the concentration here. Uh, so that's going to be our X0. Okay, and um, then we've got our transfer into the second compartment. And all of that times x0. So that should take care of all of our losses from the central compartment. Uh, and then we've got the return from uh, the second compartment. Hopefully I've got all my right uh, punctuation and everything in there. So that would be writing it for that. Then we need to deal with our second compartment. I'm going to be really lazy here and take advantage of the fact that it's almost the same as this compartment right here, except we got to change the, uh, the numbers here to 0 and 1. And get rid of those. Uh, and then we got to take care of any naming things. Okay, so we've still got our um, microscopic rate constants here. So we keep those uh, in here. So let's see, our parameters are almost going to be are going to be similar. Let's get rid of. We no longer have anything associated with Ka, Kl, Yf. All that goes away. Lost a comma there. K10, K21, let's see, we're not going to need to use the uh, quadratic equation to get any of that stuff, so I think we're down to that. Um, we've got our basic elements there, so I think we only have the four parameters, don't we? Our clearance Q, V2, V3. Uh, let's see, let's get rid of the Ka from this statement, too. Uh, I think we got that, K10. We don't need to worry about this. We can get rid of it. That's our model. Uh, assuming I didn't make any dumb typos or something. Uh, number of parameters changes. Uh, we're now knocked down to only four parameters in here uh, in two compartments, so we're going to have two F's and two T lags, so we're only going to have a total of eight in this case. Uh, our F1 is going to begin at what? Four? Yeah, it's going to be at four. Okay, add two to that and we get our for where our T lag is. And again, we've only got two compartments here. So I think we've actually finished. So that's now how we've used our template then to construct a different uh, different nonlinear differential equation model. 
Uh, so let's go ahead and save that. Let's see if we actually did it in such a way we didn't make an error, a uh, syntax error anyway. Let's go to, again, over to DEV over here and go down to Compile and Unload. And I made some kind of an error. Oh, I didn't declare a VMAX or a, I'm surprised it didn't flag KM. It should have. It, uh, but we definitely didn't declare VMAX, so it's not happy about that. So we need to... So actually, we are missing some parameters. Uh, okay, silly me. So we needed a VMAX. And so I guess why don't we make that one theta 4. And we need a KM. And we'll make that one theta 5. Okay. Um, dum, 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 dum. So I'm trying to, what is it bothered over here, though? Uh, I'm not sure what it's complaining about there, so let's just uh, rerun it because sometimes errors kind of cascade from the first error. Uh, I suppose it's probably logical to go ahead and add some more components like this here for our VMAX. It probably doesn't make a lot of sense for our VMAX to be negative. Oh, just to be safe, let's put our parentheses around it. And ditto on KM. By the way, this this is a part of it is kind of more of a nicety. It's not a necessity. Uh, it's just a way of trying to catch errors that may uh, that you might encounter due to things like passing values that don't make sense. Uh, but you know you can get you but you don't need the assert command to actually to run this. Uh, what else am I missing here? Oh, of course, we got to change some numbers because uh, though the number of compartments is still right, the number of parameters is wrong because we've got two more parameters. So we got to make that 10. Uh, let's see, we went up, so we're going to increment all of these by 2. So this is going to be 6. That's going to be 8. Okay. Now I think I have the pieces. Let's save that. And try again. And oh well, that was a very similarly silly mistake because I didn't get all the way up here. I also need to declare them. That comes from being a long time Fortran programmer and uh, being able to get away with default uh, declarations. Okay, well, let's take another shot. Compile and unload. And it says OK. OK, so we know we don't have any syntax errors. It's no guarantee there's no logic errors or something, but we know we've gotten that far. So let's uh, go ahead and take care of the rest of it. Uh, so that creates the basic model. Uh, now we have to link it up using the WB Dev components we have here. Let's go to mod in there. Let's go ahead and use the uh, in this case, you could almost use any template that's in here, but I'll go ahead and be consistent and use the one that we had named the same. So let's see, where was that? That was this guy right here, the uh, two-compartment indirect effect model RK45. Uh, why don't we actually just create, make a copy of that guy here, and we'll do it that way. Okay, and let's rename that. Okay. Par and get rid of the copy of. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead and open that up then. Oh, let's make it so we can see it again.
Okay, and this one is the editing's real simple. Again, all you, we need to do is change where we have the name here, to, uh, and that appears in at least three or four times in here. So I think we can probably actually take advantage of the yeah well, the change we did before is still there. So we can just take that and do a replace all. Okay, and then we have to compile that. So again, go to dev. Compile and unload. And down here it says OK. So again, we're fine there. And then the last bit is we go into WBDev where it says Resource, RSRC. And let's grab the functions ODC uh, and change that. So we need to create a new element in here. So we can go ahead and basically grab any one of the ones. Uh, the ones at top are different, but all of these down at the bottom are, are things that we've done for uh, uh, for Bugs Model Library. But again, I'll be consistent. So where's the, there it is right here. So why don't we go ahead and use the one that uses the, the template we're working with. Make a copy of that. And then we have to rename... Well, actually, the key, the port one that needs to be renamed is on the right-hand side here. So we've got to rename this. MM par there. Right-hand side, you again, the, though I commonly use the same name on both sides, you don't have to. You, you could name it something else. Uh, but we'll go ahead and stick with the same name for now. Okay, and just save that. And we've now created a new function, uh, a new bugs function here called 2CPT MM par RK45 that will take our two compartment model uh, bolus input with parallel first order and Michaelis Metten elimination. And we can now go ahead and use that uh, as part of our bugs model. Uh, so that was. It, depending on how you look at it, that was all there was to it, or boy, that was a lot of stuff you had to do to make that happen. But, but the core, uh, but the core of it that we were looking at, which one is it here? Must be that one. Uh, the core part right here, you'll see, really doesn't involve a lot of code. Uh, it's more that tedious process of linking it into WB Dev and keeping track that you did all the steps appropriately. Okay, that's probably about as much as I was going to show you. You may want to, for uh, uh, I guess for your own uh, experience here, I, I would suggest you go ahead and actually try working with the the original uh, example that we we're looking at the uh, uh, the that comes with the bugs model library. Actually, do I still have it open here? Or did I completely copy it over? Yeah, I guess I copied it over. Uh, but actually do that uh, indirect effect model and actually run through that and convince yourself you sort of know what the pieces are and how it connects to the, the original model. Uh, and the data is actually there if you actually want to run the example. Okay, so now we've talked about doing these kinds of custom uh, custom models on your own. Uh, and so let's let's actually make an assignment that's going to put you to work on it. Actually, before I even go through this, let me just stop real quick, see if there's questions here while I manipulate the screen here and stuff. Okay, nothing popping up so far, but I'll keep my eyes open. Uh, so okay, let's talk about what I labeled here as our hands-on example four. Uh, this one is going to be a somewhat 
more involved example in some ways, uh, sort of cut back on the data a bit, but the model is a bit more complex. Uh, we're going to be doing, it's going to be population PKPD modeling of uh, neutropenia induced by our hypothetical uh, drug candidate here, ME2. Uh, so the our fictional storyline here is that uh, neutropenia was observed in some subjects receiving higher ME2 doses in phase one. And your task is then going to be to model the relationship between neutrophil counts and drug exposure. You know, the, the idea here is, okay, we've observed this. Is it so severe uh, at any doses likely to produce any beneficial effect that we've got to kill the compound? Uh, can we do anything in terms of the dosing regimen to try and uh, to reduce the impact of the neutropenia, things like that. So the modeling exercise here would be one to allow you to do to explore uh, different treatment regimens in here. Uh, so this is we're going to model in this case only the multiple dose study. So it's going to be our phase one multiple dose study. It was a parallel dose escalation design with eight subjects per dose arm. And you can see here they were given placebo or a range of doses going from 5 to 80 milligrams, given twice a day over seven days. PK was measured at, you can see several times here, uh, going out over that uh, seven plus days here. Uh, we've got a uh, limit of quantitation on it, so you get to use your uh, the approach we talked about for dealing with sensor data also as part of this. Uh, for the pharmacodynamic endpoint, we're looking at what are called absolute neutrophil counts, uh, and they were measured daily for 12 days. Uh, and then we've got some possible patient-specific covariates I've listed here, just weight, age, or gender. Uh, so the idea then is going to be modeling these neutrophil counts as a function of the concentrations that have been observed in here. Uh, here's our data. Uh, you can see on the left-hand side the PK data. Actually, you've seen this before as part of the population PK exercise we did. So you can see we've got dense samples taken over the first two dosing intervals here, troughs in between, uh, and then finally following the last dose we've got some dense sampling done. Uh, so you can see that for all of our active treatment arms. Then for all of our treatment arms, including placebo, we've got our neutrophil counts uh, shown here on this side versus time. Uh, you can see it's pretty noisy stuff uh, for the most part, but you do see as we get up to the uh, 40 and 80 milligram doses here, uh, it's particularly evident in the 80, you can see this downward trend uh, over time in the neutrophil counts. Uh, and in particular, you're also seeing that uh, they haven't observed, they haven't measured these things long enough to really see the recovery uh, within the time frame of that study. Okay, the model we're going to use in here, uh, we're going to take advantage of a model that's been developed before. Uh, there's a couple models out here that have been proposed for this kind of uh, endpoint uh, in here. Uh, one of them is one developed by uh, Lena Freiberg, uh, Mats Carlson, and others at Uppsala. Uh, and you can label it, it's been labeled as sort of a semi-mechanistic model for drug-induced myelosuppression. The basic idea here is you've got a uh, compartment over here, which we've just labeled, it, or they labeled as prole, meaning, I guess, pro proliferative or proliferation. Uh, so that's your sort of, you know, your, that's, you know, our sort of core, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, stem cell isn't the right term here, but they've got, uh, this is where uh, our immature cells are first being formed uh, over here. Uh, so those are first being formed. They're being formed at at a rate that's related to the amount of of, of cells that are there, because of course you you need cells there to divide and so on, form it. So that's why you see this sort of circular component here, so that the rate at which new cells are being formed is 
uh, occurs at a rate proportional to the number of cells that are there uh, here. And then as cells mature, they move down this cascade. Uh, in this case, we've got a cascade involving three transit compartments uh, that represent the maturation of these of these neutrophils. We have rate constants associated with these. In this case, notice all, each of these steps are described as having the same rate constant. Uh, and, and for simplicity, you notice there's no losses shown over here. So the way this is written right now, we've got transits that basically go from one to the next. Uh, and then finally, we get to the the circulating neutrophils themselves, and this is and this is what we're actually measuring. Then is what's labeled here as CIRC. Uh, and finally, you have loss of those as those as those neutrophils are dying off or lost in some way. In here, so that's the core notion here. Is we've got our you know sort of our premature, not our immature components here. Uh, we've got the place where the original cell, immature cells are being formed. Uh, they're m maturing and then finally reach uh, reach what you see as circulating neutrophils. Uh, as I mentioned, the rate at which this original proliferation is occurring uh, is, you know, it depends upon the number of cells that are actually active in this compartment. Uh, in addition, there is a feedback process that uh, that occurs here. And you can see that the larger the circulating uh, number of of neutrophils there are, the slower that is, or vice versa. Uh, if you do something to suppress the the number of neutrophils there, there the feedback then ca causes a change in this proliferation rate uh, that we see over here, and that feedback process is you know is related to. So the reciprocal of the circulating quantity raised to some power. Uh, I guess I was making the assumption that this power here is a positive one because it was negative. All those statements would be reversed. Uh, and the assumption here for our particular drug is that what's causing the neutropenia is the drug is influencing this process right here. So that's why you see the drug effect being labeled over here. So somehow the drug is causing a change at this earliest stage and preventing uh, the, uh, the increase in the number of proliferative cells happening right here. Uh, so that's where the damage is being done, if you like. So that's the core model. Now, with the exception of the influence of the drug that we have right here, uh, the hypothesis would be is that all of these other elements are then drug-independent quantities, quantities that would somehow be, uh, you know, be, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Advantage, advantaged. Um, uh, sort of innate to to whatever the the individual system is that you're looking at here. So the quantities like KTR, KCERC, uh, this CERC zero, the gamma, all of these those would be drug independent. It's only the influence of the drug on our K-prol over here uh, that would be drug specific uh, as part of this. Uh, and and in addition, there have been a lot. There's been a lot of prior work working with this model for working in relationship to development of a variety of compounds. Uh, a lot of that's been published and is available to us. And as a result, it's possible for us to say something even before we analyze the results for our new drug. We're able to say something about, uh, about these quantities within the model. In other words, we can construct informative prior distributions for some of these parameters and that's going to be part of the exercise. The other thing I didn't mention is often this process going from the our proliferative stage here up to our mature cells uh, the rate at which that is occurring is often described in terms of a mean transit time which is what that MTT is. Okay let's put this in mathematical terms uh, and that's what we've got here uh, we can describe this in terms of a system of differential equations. So what do we got here? Five of them? Yeah, we've got five of them uh, without even considering the drug itself. 
uh, the drug PK is part of it yet. Uh, so we've got our D-Prol DT here, so that was that PROL compartment. So here we've got sort of a, a basic parameter here, K-Prol, uh, multiplying uh, the uh, the cells with number of cells within that compartment, uh, but then that's modified by a drug effect. So we've got like an inhibitory relationship assumed here, as well as the feedback uh, caused by the number of uh, you know the amount of circulating neutrophils that are there. And then finally, we have a a loss also so that's proportional to the number of cells within there. But this loss over here on the right is a loss due to maturation of of the cells that are being formed. And then finally, we go through a sequence of virtually identical uh, differential equations here, describing that maturation process as we go through the various transit compartments. So those are our five components here. We've got some possible nonlinearities here in the first one. Um, our, in this case, we're going to start with a very simple drug effect model here. We're just going to make the uh, drug effect here is proportional to the uh, drug concentration, in particular the model predicted drug concentration. Uh, C hat, and I know that's what I've got here. I said plasma drug concentration, but the hat here is intended to imply it's going to be the model predicted value of that concentration. Uh, we're going to assume that all of these K's in here, the KTR, the K circ, and the K prol are are equal uh, in the model. And finally, we're actually going to parameterize this thing in terms of this mean transit time. Uh, which is related to that KTR according to this relationship here. So you take the number of transit compartments in here. Uh, so in that case, it's referring to these intermediate compartments here, the transit 1, 2, and 3. So in our case, it's if n is 3, this is going to be 4 divided by KTR for MTT. And as I've noted here, all of the parameters in red uh, we're going to refer to as system parameters or drug independent quantities that we're going to assign uh, informative prior distributions to. Uh, for our PK component, uh, we're just going to use a two compartment model with first order absorption just like we did before. So we're using the same model that we had in, uh, in exercise three. Um, so as I say, it's the same as before, except we're only going to use the phase one multiple dose data. Uh, as I say, arguably you could uh, do a more comprehensive approach by using all of the available PK data. You know, you know. In other words, we could include that phase one uh, single dose data in here, but I tried to keep it simpler by just uh, cutting the data down a bit. Um, and the other thing I mentioned is right now, well, my intention is to assign you a simultaneous PKPD modeling effort, uh, but it wouldn't have to be. You could uh, actually do this as a staged modeling effort where you could do the population PK modeling first, summarize the results of that, uh, in the form of, well, what would, you know, basically you would take the posterior distributions from the PK modeling exercise, code them then as, uh, as prior distributions to analyze the PD data. Uh, so that's another option you could do uh, as, as part of the modeling effort. But for now, we're just going to do it as a simultaneous modeling exercise. Uh, let's incorporate some... Uh, inter-individual variation on the PD parameters. You know, so we had it on the PK parameters, and we'll use the same structure as you did before for that. But for our PD parameters, let's put um, log normal uh, inter-individual variation on our mean transit time, uh, the baseline. Uh, uh, let's see, our, our baseline neutrophil counts, and uh, the log of our our PD parameter here, that alpha, the, that's the quantity that multiplies the uh, plasma concentration. Uh, and finally, a log normal residual variation in the absolute neutrophil count uh, in here. And notice here I'm treating these as all just uh, univariate 
normals here, no correlations amongst them. Uh, and then for prior distributions, uh, f let's use informative priors uh, for the pharmacodynamic system parameters that we think are drug independent. Uh, and and uh, what I propose is we'll go ahead and use for, for our means of our prior distributions, let's use the mean of uh, values that have been published for these. Uh, for the variance on that, uh, I'm suggesting rather than using the standard deviation of the published values, let's inflate uh, that standard deviation a bit to allow for the possibility that, you know, that maybe our new data isn't exactly exchangeable with the old data. Uh, and let's go ahead and uh, inflate it a bit. So I just kind of arbitrarily picked a factor of two. So for our prior standard deviation, I'm going to we'll use two times the standard deviation of the published values. Uh, I'll use normal priors for the log of our circ zero, our baseline here, and our uh, mean transit time and the gamma parameter. Uh, but then use uh, gamma priors for the precisions associated with our, you know, our circ zero and our MTT. Am I missing one? Oh yeah, no, that's fine. I, for, I keep forgetting the alphas. Uh, we're going to use a weekly informative prior. Okay, so that takes care of those. And here I give specific amounts for each one, each one of those that are based upon what was reported in the literature. So I'm not going to make you do the work of digging those out of the literature. Uh, the only little extra thing you are going to have to work to do is notice I've written the uh, in for the precisions. Uh, for our baseline and for our mean transit time, I've written in terms of means and standard deviations, but we're talking about gamma distributions, and the usual way of parameterizing gammas is not in terms of means and standard deviations. So you're going to have to do a little work there to translate from mean and standard deviation to the uh, parameterization that gets used for the gamma distributions. Uh, and then for the remaining parameters we have here are for the uh, uh, for that alpha parameter and uh, and the standard deviation of the for the inter individual variability in that parameter and these are fairly weakly uh, informative priors for those two. So hopefully I've covered all of those priors on that. Uh, there's, you know, you've got an example folder in there that has the various pieces you need. So it's called ME2 Hands-On 4. Uh, the data is in there in a non-mem format here. So it's ME2 Hands-On 4 non-mem data dot CSV. Uh, there's both a, now there's, a, there's basically the answer to that's already in there. There's the, the bugs model and the R script and the, uh, corresponding bugs model library module that you would have to use for that. Uh, my suggestion to you is actually, you know, it, depending upon how much you want to sort of learn how to do on your own, would be to, to actually put those someplace else and build them yourself, particularly uh, the bugs model and the bugs model library module. Uh, I'm less concerned about, you know, the R script, learning the elements of the R script, though that's useful too. Um, but I would suggest you set those aside and actually try to build it on your own. Uh, you can use the, you know, again, you could use the Bugs Model Library examples that that are distributed with Bugs Model Library as a foundation to try and build on. So in doing that. Um, I guess I didn't say whether to, which solver to use for this. I actually suggest you try using both and see how it does. Uh, you know, maybe start out trying to use do it using the Runga Kutta solver, uh, and then uh, recode it for the LSODA. Basically, once you get it worked out for one, the translation for the other is is fairly simple in here. So so pick one and and solve the problem for that, and then try the other. Let's see. Okay, where are we here? Um, let's see. Let me take a breath here and see if there's 
uh, if there's questions on this uh, and uh, on the model and how to proceed with it. Okay, so far nothing. Again, I'll, I'll keep an eye out in case you're doing some heavy typing there. Uh, let's, and I'll start moving on to the next topic here for today. So far what I've talked about is how to use the bugs model library to build new, you know, PK and PK, PK and PD models, but sometimes that's, that's not the kind of thing you want. Uh, so what you've seen here you know, with Bugs Model Library, everything's very structured around the notion of compartmental models uh, and building functions that are relevant to that and having to deal with things like, you know, dosing regimens and having to keep track of those kinds of event histories. Sometimes you want to do something that that just isn't, doesn't fit within that framework, but you'd still like to have some new function that isn't inside of bugs, particularly because, as I pointed out before, WinBugs, though it's very rich in terms of what you can do in terms of the probabilistic structure of the model, if you've got a fairly complicated uh, you know, set of deterministic or algebraic calculations to make, uh, bugs is not well structured for that. I mean, it doesn't even have basic things like if-then-else structures or, you know, while loops and things like that. So it would be nice to be able to to have those in there. Well, you can't get them directly, but you can get them indirectly by building your own functions. And fortunately, a while back, David Lunn had put together a package called WBDev, which was stood for WinBugs Development Interface. You can see a reference to a, a short article about it down here at the bottom. Uh, he put that together, uh, which allows us to to write such functions. In fact, it also allows us to do distributions. I wasn't going to go there today to show you how to do distributions, at least not today. But uh, and I've had rel and I've had relatively limited experience in working with that capability. But I've often used it for writing new functions. So you know, in the, in the parlance of WinBugs, these would be. Uh, uh, logical nodes uh, in here. So I wanted to show you how you can do that yourself. Uh, it's in a, and to a large extent it's similar to what we've done when we've looked at Bugs Model Library and for good reason because the way I interface Bugs Model Library to WinBugs actually makes use of WBDev as you've seen when we've gone into there's a folder we've been going into and having to modify something uh, in a folder called wbdev. So let's talk about it. So so again it's a WinBugs add-on for constructing new functions. Um, you can there's here's a link right here uh, that you can go to that um, where you can download uh, the wbdev package and there's some discussion about it. Uh, you'll also find I think David's got a couple of other uh, other things on there also, but the one we'll focus on today is WBDev. Uh, now, you don't actually, right now, for our work, you don't need to install it because you've already got it. It's already installed in that black box WinBugs folder that I distributed to you. Uh, and in using WBDev in addition to WinBugs requires the black box component builder, but then again, you already have that because that black box WinBugs uh, folder contains, well what it contains is it contains the black box component builder into which I've imported uh, WinBugs and WBDev. So you've got all the components you need already. But if you build up your own uh, installation you would have to download and install it yourself. 
So, uh, best way to show you how to do this is probably to uh, uh, to demo it. Uh, and what I'll do is demo it. Uh, now I'm using a PK example just because that's I figure something familiar to all of us in here. But you could use it for other kinds of functions too. Uh, but we'll do a just a simple two compartment model with bolus input and really simple just single dose uh, in here and we'll use the good old clearance volume parameterization like we've been doing for a lot of our examples so so here the basic mod function then we're gonna do it's our good old uh, you know by exponential thing here hopefully I, I wrote this in a hurry hopefully I got all the pieces right here so we've got our uh, various components in here um, and then in order to write this in terms of our clearance and volume and everything I've got to calculate these uh, our lambda 1 and lambda 2 here from our quadratic equation uh, and you know, I've got all my microscopic rate constants that I derive from my uh, clearance and volume terms here so we're gonna write a function uh, like that okay so Let's see, what did I have next? Okay, so that's what we're going to do. Let's uh, head back into Windows World here. Okay, why don't we get rid of all the stuff we were doing before here. Okay, so now we're going to work entirely in WB Dev. Now, even before I do some of this, let me point you to some things that will give you... Uh, places to go here uh, so I'm in the this is the WB dev folder one of the first places you probably want to go is to the docu uh, docu folder here which contains uh, some information and in particular there's two sort of instruction manuals in here one you can see is WB dev distributions and the other is WB dev functions it's the WB dev functions we're going to work with today so let me open that up. So I'm not going to show you in detail what it's got. I just wanted to lead you to it. But you'll see here it goes through and it, it, it goes through a essentially a tutorial uh, describing the use for, for building it. Uh, you'll see, let me point out a couple of things. Uh, there's two key templates in there. Uh, there's one called WB Dev Scalar Template, uh, which is for writing functions that return a scalar value. In other words, just a single value item. Uh, but then there's another template. Uh, okay, here we go. Called WB Dev Vector Template for returning vector value functions. Uh, so so we've got both of those templates to work with and that's what we're going to build from and as I say the this sheets are basically a a tutorial carrying you through the process of actually building such functions uh, I'm not going to actually follow his template we'll do the example I just cited here so let's go ahead and do it let's uh, go in here let's I'm going to go in mod uh, so we're, let's go ahead and grab the uh, template. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so we're going to want the scalar template. Where'd it go? There it is, right there. So we're going to open that. Uh, actually, let's open the black box first and pull it into it. Grab that. So let me make everything bigger. Okay, so uh, the way he's got this set up is the things that you will probably want to change are in blue uh, in here. These numbers at the beginning here uh, are all comments. Actually, I never mentioned that. In Component Pascal, the way you write comments is you start a comment with an open parentheses and an asterisk, and you close a comment with an asterisk and a closed parentheses. So all of those things in there are comments in here. So we're going to do our, we're going to create our two compartment bolus here, our two compart, our single dose, uh, two compartment in here. 
Uh, so we'll pick a name for it. So one of the first things you have to do is pick a name and change the name at the top and the bottom here. Or so uh, and so we're going to change wherever it says scalar template. Uh, oops, wrong button. There we go. Wherever it says that, we're going to give it uh, a new name here. Uh, let's call it, uh, I don't know, how about 2CPT. Actually, I'll make sure I didn't, since I was monkeying around with this and creating the example for you, I need to use a different name here, I think. Uh, trying to remember what I called it. Oh, I called it Scalar 2CPT. Well, we'll just call this one 2CPT Scalar. Uh, in here and replace all the cases of that which is probably just the top and the bottom yeah okay so that's one of the first things you need oh and the first thing I actually need to do is make one of my favorite things is to do something like that and then save it over and copy over the thing I don't want to let's do a save as and give it the same name so that's going to be our 2CPT scaler Okay, and that and that name does need to match the name that you're using uh, at the top and the bottom here. Okay, so we've got that. Now we have to go through and decide on a few things, like how do we want to structure our pass our parameters in here. Uh, so let's um, let's say what the way we're going to want is we're going to want to write a bugs function uh, where when we call this, it will call the parameters in the order time dose and then a vector of parameter values so time's going to be a scalar so and dose will be a scalar and then the parameters will be a vector and one of the first things you so you need to do then is if that's going to be the case this list right here where it says vss here now the original parameter was going to have or original the the original template was for a function where uh, the first argument was a vector, and the other, and it had two other arguments, and they were both scalars. Well, we're, I said let's do it in the other order, so we're going to change this to SSV. Oh, lost my blue. Okay, so again, uh, we're going to do it in the order of time, dose, and then the vector of parameters. Um, these constants here that are defined here, this is you don't need to do this, but I think this is a good idea to to improve readability. Uh, this is really telling you the order in which things are going to be in the arguments. Now, the way for the previous one, he had an order of parameters, dose, time. I wanted to do the other way around, which I'm going to do. And the way I do that is just by renumbering these. I'm going to make this zero dose stays one which is actually the second argument and then parameters becomes the third one or a two here uh, so that's going to be our three arguments in here are going to be those three items uh, we're going to need a set of variables here uh, they're going to be a little different than the original than our template because we're going to do clearance q v1 and v2 uh, and we're going to get rid of the ones they have here. Okay, and we still have dose and time, and which we'll call D and T here. Uh, and the next part that's probably the most cryptic, and as I recall, one of the most poorly described in his, uh, uh, in the tutorial is how you actually grab the arguments, because it's not obvious when you look at the declaration for the procedure right here how you get to the things you want uh, there's actually some functions uh, there's this thing called func arguments uh, which is the thing that connects you to the arguments to the bugs function here uh, and <coughs> and let's actually start with the simplest ones which is our scalars so in fact let me order them in the in the way that we're actually going to use them to some degree the ordering is a little arbitrary here but again I'm trying to improve readability a little bit 
So we're going to do our time and our dose here. Uh, the So we're going to have time. So funk arguments and then notice in square brackets time, which actually notice here equals zero. So that's going to take the, so it's basically saying grab the first argument. And when I put a zero here, it's saying grab the first element of the first argument. Well, in this case, the first argument is a scalar. So there actually is only one element, but it does require this notation. Uh, similarly, now for the uh, dose, same deal. Uh, it's dose, which happens to be the second argument, which gets labeled as a one, again, because of the way uh, component Pascal starts everything from zeros, and again, a zero here. Uh, now for our other parameters, so let's order our parameters. Let's do it as in the same order I gave in, in the list here. Let's do it as clearance, Q, V1, and we'll have to create a new one here. V2, and we'll get it rid of this KE thing here. Okay, actually we're going to change a little bit more than that. Uh, here in his original template, he passed everything as logs. I'm not going to do that. So let me get rid of that. So to get my clearance, which is going to be the first element of the third argument, okay, I get this part of the statement right here going up to where it says parameters. That's grabbing then the third argument. So that's because notice parameters equals a 2, again, numbering 0, 1, 2. So that actually is the third argument. And then I want to get the first element of that third argument. And then let's go through again, get rid of the exponentials on the rest of these. And closing parentheses here. And I'm going to change that to a 3. So, and here I'm getting the second, uh, second element of the third argument third element of the third argument and the fourth element of the third argument. So these four lines here then are actually pulling out the elements of a single vector argument in here which contains all of our parameters. So again that's a little bit cryptic I realize but that's uh, that's the theme here and how we're making that connection. Uh, and then down here we need, so that pulls in all of our parameters, relates our, the quantities we want to work with in our model here to, uh, to, the, to uh, the arguments uh, of the bugs function. Then uh, we're going to write out our model here. So uh, of course before you, uh, we're going to assume the dose is at time zero, by the way, I guess I didn't say that. So let's assume we've got a bolus dose at time zero. So for any time less than zero, the the value you want to return is zero and notice actually the output value for our uh, for our procedure here is going is called value uh, right here so that's why we're assigning it to the name value down here uh, but then if it's uh, greater than or equal to t we've got to calculate uh, the values for our model so we have to do a little work here by the way keep in mind we are now in a real procedural programming language. This isn't like WinBugs where the order of statements is irrelevant. The statement order of statements is now relevant. It It is the order in which things are calculated. Okay, so we need to do... Mind you, let's go back up to our... Come on, go back up there. What we're calculating. No, not that. There we go. Uh, so we're gonna do, we got to do all this junk here. So we've got our clearance and our V1 and our Q and our V2 and all that. So we've got to do those steps. Then we've got to calculate our lambdas. And then finally we can calculate the rest. Okay, so we need to do our, you know, K10 is our clearance over V1. Again, remember all your punctuation here. K12 is Q over V1. K21 is Q over V2. 
Okay, and then we got to go through all that uh, nonsense to calculate our, our lambdas here. Um, trying to remember if I had a nice example that would allow me to be lazy here. Um, yeah, probably not here. Let's actually calculate something I'm going to call k-sum, which is going to be uh, k10 plus k12 plus k21, since that shows up a couple of times here. And then we'll just do, uh, we'll pick one of our lambdas here. Uh, oh, why don't I illustrate using a vector here for the heck of it here. Let's we'll call we'll call them lambda we'll make vector make lambda a vector in fact let me show you how do you declare a vector um let me show you that so lambda uh and if i want that to be a vector of two values two real values i would say array 2 of real so that's how I declare a vector there of two values. And so that's going to be which? So that's going to be our, uh, uh, let's put that, it's going to be k sum. Uh, let's see, which order do we do these? I guess lambda zero would be the biggest one, right? Yeah. Okay, so that's going to be k sum plus. Uh, Square root and the square root in here uh, is written as math dot. Now I got to remember. Do I need? I think I need a capital S Q R T. In here, um, and that's going to be k sum squared. Now I got to remember the right. Okay. I've got to remember the right uh, operator. I think it's a, a caret symbol, but now I don't remember. So I'm going to go grab the right answer. I'm going to grab my answer key here. Okay, where do we go? Uh, let's see here. Oh, <laughs> I didn't even use it in there. I don't even remember now whether it's a double asterisk or a uh, there, but I cheated the last time. I guess I'll cheat this time too. Either way, it's fine. Okay, it's going to be k sum squared uh, minus 4 times k10 times k21. Uh, let's see, I guess I need one more parentheses and divide by 2. Let's widen this out here. Okay, I think I got that right. I won't swear to it. Uh, that was very clever. That's not what I wanted to do, but there we go. And then for lambda 1, again, we'll use the convention that that would be the smaller of the two, and we just have to stick a minus there. So assuming I didn't mess something up in there, that should be right. And then finally we have to write out our final equation here. So value is going to be, oh, let's see, how did I write it out before? Dose over V, okay. So that's going to be D over V1 star Lambda zero minus lambda one. And then we got our what do we got here? K lambda one minus K two one. Or in the world of Component Pascal lambda zero minus k to one 
times, and then for the exponential, it's math.exp, and it, it is case sensitive. Minus lambda zero star t. Here, actually, why don't we go ahead and stick these guys on a second line? And that's plus k to one minus lambda one. Uh, did I get that right? Yes. Okay, let's see, do I have, what am I missing? I'm missing a closing parentheses, I think. Okay, we don't need that line, and I don't know why Dave included that bit down there. I don't think it's necessary for what we're doing. Okay, I think we've got all the pieces in there. Sorry, let's scroll back. Okay. Uh, the only thing I may have missed, I think we need to make some declarations because we added a couple of names here. At least I know we added k sum, so we need to declare that. We did the lambdas already. Oh, we didn't do the k's. Uh, and I think that's all of them. We'll know soon enough because if we didn't, it'll tell us. Okay, so we save that. And then go to dev, compile, and unload. And I didn't declare something. What was it? Oh, I misspelled that I needed a capital here. As I say, it's case sensitive. And OK, it gives us our little tiny OK over here. So it, it compiled, so there's no syntax errors in it. Uh, so that's our that's the core part then we've created a new function that we can link into bugs we need to do one or more step uh, actually do I still have that open no I don't we need to go to uh, the RSRC folder right here grab the functions.odc pull that in and we have and this is where we make it's essentially a lookup table uh, we're going to create a new function in here uh, this was the original template uh, this is uh, the first item on top here is what was originally connect okay that's not what I wanted to do let's try that again okay why are you being stubborn there it goes So we w we're going to return a scalar value. So that's what this S means here, is that the function is going to return a scalar value. Uh, over here is where you list uh, the types of arguments you're going to have. And recall that we did ours differently. Instead of VSS, it was SSV. So we changed the last one to there. It was S. You can see also that tells you how many arguments uh, here. So you could have more or less arguments depending upon the function you want to create. Notice, for example, all the ones for uh, for Bugs Model Library down here, they all have, what is it, seven arguments? No, three, four, no, nine, I think. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, they have nine arguments, which, by the way, is the, I believe, is the maximum. It was nine or ten is the maximum that uh, WBDev will allow. Notice these are all vectors, and the return value is a vector uh, for all the WinBugs ones. But for others that you customize, you have your choice between scalar or vector arguments in here. So let's see, we change that. Uh, we have to change the name over here on the right to be uh, the corresponding name that we just used. And what did we what did we call it? Uh, called it scalar to CPT, so we can actually leave the word scalar there. So we call it to CPT on that side, and then on the left-hand side, we can say we can decide what we want to call it. 
So, you know, we can give it some kind of name here. So, uh, you know, I could actually use the same name if I want, or we could call it, I don't know, uh, how about scalar to CPT. I think it'll allow, use, yeah, it allows numbers in there. So we can give it that name. So this name on the left-hand side is the name that you would have to use inside, uh, inside WinBugs. Uh, so that takes care of that. We've compiled it, so we've actually got a function we could use. Uh, and in fact, let me illustrate that a step further. And here I am going to be lazy and use what I've already put together for you rather than build it uh, from scratch, because otherwise we're going to run out of time anyway. Let's go back to our class stuff. And let's see here. I have... Yeah, I recall it. Now, assuming you've seen it, I had posted on the course website um, both a revised uh, set of handouts, but also a uh, a folder that contains uh, what we're looking at right here called WB Dev Demo. Uh, and actually, the example I just did for you uh, is essentially the same, assuming I did it right. Uh, as the one here that's called uh, Scalar 2 CPT uh, right here. Uh, did I just get that wrong? Oh, you know why? Because I think, I thought I called it something different. Oh, yeah, I did, because it's actually 2 C. I see I just did this wrong. Because uh, I confused that. Okay, where are we going? I just realized here... Uh, this should actually be the one we just did now I called 2CPT Scalar. It was the other way around here, uh, whereas I called the one that I gave, gave you Scalar 2CPT, uh, just to confuse us. Okay, but let me show you that I've got a, which one is it, the 2CPT test? Yes. Let me pull this over. This is actually a bug, a very simple bugs model. It's a bugs model that can't fit anything, in fact, uh, because it's actually just doing a simulation. But that's when I write these kinds of functions, that's usually the first thing I do is test them, not by trying to fit data with them, but by just trying to do a simple simulation and often checking it against what I know to be true. In this case, I didn't actually do that check, but I, I do the simulation. So notice what I've got here. So we've got our basic model. So that's going from here to here. And here I'm specifying, uh, well, first one, there's some data here where all I've done is specified a number of times. I call it n times and a t min and a t max. So what I'm actually setting this up to do is to simulate concentrations, uh, 101 concentrations starting at 0 and ending at 24, all equally spaced. Uh, DT here uh, is is the distance between distance in time difference in time between those equally sampled times. Uh, I pa created a vector of parameters here. I just called them P. I uh, call that uh, that vector P here, and you can see I've given it values for clearance Q, V1, and V2, just arbitrary numbers. I've got a dose of 100. Here and then I just do a loop over uh, over all of those times. Then where first I have to calculate the time uh, that corresponds to a particular increment here. So it's just the beginning time plus that dt times uh, the number of you know basically the the i it's i minus one actually, uh, and then I calculate the concentration. Uh, actually, that's actually enough. I could just do that. In fact, let's comment this one out just to illustrate that. Uh, we can actually use that as a simulation uh, in here to test our model. So, for example, I can just uh, go go to model, pick model specification. Okay, so let's highlight model here and click on check model. So, assuming everything works. Okay, where's the bottom of that? Uh, it says model. Oh, I forgot to change. You know what? Let's. Uh, this is testing the other 
function here. You know what I something I need to mention too. The when you create a new function like that, it's actually not available in the Winbug session that you currently have open because it actually doesn't become active until you open another instance of Winbugs. So what we're actually going to do here is let's actually close this. Uh, let's see. I change. Yeah, let's go ahead and change. That, save the changes to that functions. Yes, I want to save that too. Okay, let's open it again. Let's grab our uh, two CPT test that we just monkeyed with. Let's do one slight more monkeying because recall we called that. What did we call it? Now I've forgotten. Oh, I know. I, we called. Didn't we call it Scalar Two CPT? As in, like, I think that's what we called it. So we got to change that. Let's go ahead and see if it compiles okay and everything. So I pick check model. It says model is syntactically correct. That's a good thing because if for some reason we had gotten the name wrong right here or if it hadn't compiled, we would have gotten an error right there. Uh, this is the data in this case are just some constants we're passing to it. So let's load that. We do compile. Model compiled. That's promising. Uh, there are no, there's no inits to load here. In fact, there's no random variables in here right now. The only drawback to that is you, if you try to save using the sample monitoring tool, it doesn't work because that only works for random variables. Uh, but what I can do is let's go to model update. Let's just do one. Oh, actually, it's not refresh. I wanted to change it to this, the updater. Let's just do one iteration. Since it's deterministic, every iteration is going to be identical. So there's no reason to do more than one. I'll go ahead and say uh, hit one. It says, okay, it says updates took zero seconds. Good thing is I didn't get an error, or we would have seen a trap window. Then go to info. I don't think I showed you this before. Go to info, node info. And this is a place where you can look at the current values of any variable uh, that's in here. It doesn't let you look at like a history if you're doing MCMC, but if you just want to look at the current values, which is fine for a deterministic simulation like this. So I put in a name. So for example, let's take a look at the concentration values. And if I hit that, it'll open up a log window. Oops. Come on, let me get to it. Okay, and it just lists all of the simulated values here. So we can do at least a, a quick check. Oh, that's interesting. Why didn't it start at 1? I expected it to start at 1. That's 1. Okay, that's a mild surprise. What did I do? Minus one. I'm wondering if I did something funny in my program when I did it, because I would have expected that. Uh, see, we've got a volume central volume of distribution of a hundred. We've got a dose of a hundred, so I would have expected the concentration at time zero to be one, but it came out less than one, which I wouldn't have thought should be. I suspect I made a programming error someplace here that caused that. Uh, T-min's definitely zero. Well, I'm not sure I want to put you through a lot of debugging here, but I'm going to take one quick look at something here to see if we can combine the obvious error. So where do we go here? We called that. Oh, what am I looking at? Looking at the wrong thing here. We got to be in WB Dev. Uh, 
Okay, which one was it? Was it two compartment scalar or scalar two compartment? Now I keep forgetting which one is which here. I think it was two compartment scalar. Yes, it was. T over V1, lambda. Zero. Yeah, I suspect. I'm not sure what it is. Somewhere in there, there's probably a little error I did in my uh, my extemporaneous programming there. That's always something that can get you into trouble because that shouldn't quite right. The rest of the numbers, let's see, do they even look reasonable? Uh, well, they're going down, which is a good thing. Yeah, they look reasonable. So if you there, you there's a problem for you. Figure out where I'd made a, uh, an error here because there has to be one. Uh, somewhere in my programming because if I redo this thing now using um, the the other function which I believe I just called scalar two comp in fact I think I just called it what it was just two CPT with capitals in it oops if we do that Okay. And it must not have been called that. What did I call it? Well, I know one way to find out. Let's actually get rid of that and bring in the original version here before I bore you with my wandering through this stuff. If I haven't already. Oh, yeah, I had a lower case. That was my problem. Anyway, if we do it with uh, this version, I think we'll find we don't have that same problem. And let's go ahead and do that again. Where's our... Uh, do our update. Boom. And go back to our node tool. Actually, let's clear this thing here so we don't confuse it with the old one. Yeah, that one came out. That's what I expected was to see the one at the beginning. So I obviously made a uh, an, a programming error somewhere in there. But you got the basic gist then of putting together a scalar function. Now we're about out of time, but what I wanted to show you is that it's fairly easy to extend that uh, to allow to create uh, to create a vector function that instead of just returning the value for that two compartment model for one time, it could return it for a vector of times. Uh, and rather than actually go through the programming effort here, let me just show you that. Uh, right here. Okay, I thought I would show you. Come on. Okay, well, it's behaving weirdly. Okay. Okay, so what this is is a version where I've taken the vector template instead of the scalar template and modified that. And most of the code is actually the same as what you saw before for the scalar. Uh, one important difference here is the first argument, which was for time, is now a vector argument instead of a scalar argument. So that changes. Uh, I kept the same order here where we've got it goes time, dose, and then parameters here. I called it times instead of time just to emphasize it's now a scalar of multiple times. Um, let's see, I think 
yeah everything up here is the same except introducing this num times uh, integer value here uh, all of this stuff up here uh, is the same uh, there until we get down here now actually if you look inside here this bit right here is the same as we did before or it's probably the correct ways I probably made an error in the other one uh, but it's this is essentially the same as what I had done before then for the scalar but now it's embedded inside of a loop uh, in this case I used a, a while loop uh, so I start out by initializing my this I this index to zero and and so it just says that while that index is less than the number of times uh, grab the appropriate time value so here it's grabbing that argument so remember times is going to be zero so it's the first argument and it's going to grab the ith element of that vector argument uh, to return a time it then goes through and depending upon what the time is either returns a zero or calculates the value from our two compartment model in there and then it increments this ink i just increments i so that's the equivalent to saying i equals i plus one in here uh, and then goes back until finally i is bigger than num times and it drops out of that uh, of this and then finally gets to the last end statement which returns control back back to your bugs and it returns a vector of values because notice that values is now instead of a scalar values is a vector quantity here that you have to index so but otherwise it's it's pretty much the same uh, when you call it inside bugs again it's a little bit different because you've got a vector valued value that gets returned uh, where we go here here it is two CPT vector test uh, and if you look in here this again is very similar to what you saw before except now the call to our there's only a single call that's not inside of a loop so you can see here it's calling it uh, it's going to return you can see here it says const one to n times so we've actually got a a vector valued result now so you just make the one call in general if you're working in a situation where uh, where you can return a vector valued quantity like this rather than putting it in a loop inside of bugs it's probably to your advantage to do so because it will usually be more computationally it'll be computationally more efficient to do it inside of uh, do the loop inside of uh, component Pascal rather than doing it inside of bugs. Okay, I think that's probably that's pretty much all I've got for today. I'd encourage you to take a look at that. I don't actually have any assignments based around using WBDev itself, but it's it's worthwhile skill set. Uh, to have because it it certainly enlarges the range of things you can do with wind bugs uh, and I guess I'll uh, see if there's any last questions here uh, stick around for a minute and uh, and after that we'll I'll say goodbye until Thursday also a reminder that next week is um, is Thanksgiving's week and uh, I won't be here uh, we won't be having class next week so that gives you lots of time to work on example four. Okay, I'm not seeing anything popping up here yet, so I guess I'm going to go ahead and say goodbye for now and uh, see you on Thursday.